Good morning. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's time to start. I am Stimo Dasolinauskas. It's a really difficult name to pronounce to remember, so I don't expect you to do. Uh, yesterday we decided that you can call me Steve. You know, it's, it's easier for everyone. And in advance I have to apologize if I will make mistakes on some of your names, also because lack of preparation or disrespect is just sometimes that happens. So, first of all, I would like to welcome you here. I think it will be a really, really nice event. Uh, uh, my uh, history with events like that, usually I participate as a journalist, says that the best events are when it's quite informal, when there are people talking from the heart, when they are saying what they really want to say and people asking questions, what they really want to know. So, I hope this event will be exactly like that. Now, uh, one very important thing for you and for viewers online, uh, this forum is organized by a digital communication network and obviously we have to say a big thank you for the US Department of State and 50 Minutes, uh, they are sponsors, or, or sponsors of the exchange programs and uh, actually I want to say thank you for all the attendees I and mean, you come here, you came here often, I really expect that you will have good time not only in the uh, classes, in the workshops, but after that too so, right now, I simply want to introduce our first speaker. Uh, this form is called Truth Matters, It Really Matters, and I think we will have an opportunity to talk uh, about that a lot more. But the first speaker is the advisor of President of Lithuania, Witness Lukasiewicz, the stage is yours. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the invitation, and I guess to be formal. I will read the welcoming address by Your Excellency the Director of Skyte, President of the Republic of Ukraine. Dear participants of the forum, many of you are those whose work is featured on the front pages of the media. In all television and radio news, we get usually the information provided to me. It spreads through social networks and is discussed by thousands of people. You are guides in the difficult world of politics. Therefore, responsibility, honesty, and decency of the political journalists are unquestionable qualities that are taken for granted. We are well aware of the cases when propaganda becomes a threatening tool. The journalists must remain committed to their professional duty or witness on the field. It's not accidental. But over the past years, we've been speaking so much about informational warfare in which no expense is spared and no consideration is given to men. We must find an adequate response to this. We often have to fight hard for the truth and spare no effort to prove it. The truthfulness of the fact is the most solid basis we need to keep, which is worth fighting for all honorable means. Politics is an area which determines the lives of people in countries, but this does not mean that people always fully understand its importance. We can clearly see this when elections are approaching, be it in Lithuania or in the United States of America. So we look again at new journalists with the expectation that information gathered by you will not only be accurate, also put in an interesting way, certainly following closely the principles of honorable journalism and ethics. Thank you for your difficult and good job, which is very important in the political life of every country. It helps to bring civil society together and serves progress. Congratulations to all of the participants of the forum. I wish you fruitful work as well as great professional success to each and every of you. The Lady Volskaya is the President of the Republic of Ukraine. Thank you, Martinez. By the way, talking about informal things, Martinez is a uh, uh, advisor of president and he is a head of uh, foreign policy group so when we are talking about useful contacts and all that stuff just remember this man it can be really val valuable contact for you I guess and now uh, I want to introduce a second speaker uh, it's uh, Thomas Barzikas he's CEO of 15 minutes he's my employee so I will probably just give him my, my microphone and will not say anything else 
Good morning. I'm not employee, I'm employer, Skirmantas. <laughs> Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Vilnius. Uh, I'm very glad that uh, this conference is taking place in um, this beautiful city that we love a lot. And I hope uh, you have a chance to explore it. Um, our organization uh, is really believing in this uh, uh, truth matters concept. It uh, doesn't matter is it uh, daily reporting, investigative journalism, or our new project uh, that is started by Liapa, checked by 15 minutes. So um, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Vlad and Liapa especially who organized it. Uh, you are great guys. Thanks for bringing all these international political journalists to Vilnius. And um, I would like to wish you to expand your professional network and, uh, of course, to have fun doing that. Have a good day in Vilnius. Okay, thank you, Thomas. And uh, we are in a really nice place. It's, uh, uh, we are so used to say that in Lithuania that you have to check how it is in English. It's International Relations and Political Science uh, uh, Institute. Here, uh, lots of great lectures are right here and lots of great events are organized here. Now I want to introduce to you uh, head of Institute of International Relations and Political Science is uh, Ramona Silpishauskas and he will probably say a few words too. Good morning. <coughs> I'm still on holidays, so uh, I will be less formal. But uh, in addition to thanking uh, the initiators of this event, Portal 15 Minutes, also U.S. State Department, uh, which is supporting this event, uh, U.S. Embassy and Lithuanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and welcoming you as a host to this Institute of International Relations and Political Science of Vilnius University. I also want to share with you some reflections uh, as a political scientist uh, why truth really matters in politics. Uh, and I hope my comments will provide a background for your, your further discussion. So to start with what is politics? Uh, let's remember the basics. Uh, politics uh, is often defined as who gets what, when, and how. Uh, this is very simple traditional definition. Uh, political scientist Easton also defines politics as authoritative allocation of values. Uh, and here we see several important elements. First of all, Politics is about compulsory decisions. In our private life, what we decide, what we say, whether it's true or not, mostly concerns ourselves, our family, our friends, a small circle of people. In politics, whatever policymakers say and do affects all of us. Because laws are compulsory, you know, you have to pay taxes, you have to obey traffic uh, rules, uh, there are thousands uh, or hundreds of thousands various regulations. So what politicians say and do is important because it's, uh, it concerns all people who live in a particular country. Uh, therefore, uh, fact-checking, uh, whether they speak truth or, or they, they lie, is uh, particularly important. The second uh, point is about the nature of democratic politics. Uh, pluralistic societies are defined by political competition. So, especially when elections are approaching, politicians have very strong incentives to exaggerate their achievements, their positive uh, aspects of their, their activities and minimize their failures minimize their mistakes. So it's not just personal features, it's, it's a nature of democratic politics uh, defined by competition that strongly incentivizes politicians to behave in such a way. For example, opposition as a rule uh, tends to criticize current state of affairs in a country. Look at Donald Trump, uh, what he is talking about administration, current U.S. administration, President Obama's policies. Uh, earlier this week, he, he gave a speech, as you probably know, on foreign policy of the U.S. And uh, Associated Press journalists uh, wrote a whole list of uh, 
uh, untrue statements that he, he made during the speech by assessing uh, policies of President Obama in the Middle East, uh, foreign policies in general. We have the same now in Lithuania. Our parliamentary elections are approaching. They will take place in October. If you listen to opposition, to, for example, Conservative Party politicians, you would get an impression there is really nothing good in Lithuania. Economy is doing badly, education is destroyed, everything, uh, you know, is just in a miserable state. If you listen to Social Democrats, who are the main coalition partner, Prime Minister is from this party, you will get an impression everything is perfect in Lithuania. No problems, just come and enjoy life and live here. Uh, so, what I want to say is that we have to be aware of this, uh, of these pressures. So, it's not that all politicians are inherent liars. <laughs> Even those that are really trying to be honest, that believe in uh, public good, in, in public interest, they still are pushed by competing parties, by, by their competitors uh, in the elections to to exaggerate so good things and to minimize, minimize uh, uh, their favors, their mistakes. And I think in many countries, voters also uh, are seen as not forgiving uh, mistakes. So there is very little culture of publicly acknowledging that I was wrong. It's very rare, at least in Lithuania, and I noticed in most other countries, maybe less so in Nordic states, for a politician to publicly say, I was wrong. Uh, everyone makes mistakes, it's, it's human. But uh, again, in politics, you will very rarely hear about something uh, that was done uh, wrong and, and uh, politicians acknowledging that. My third point is about what do we mean when we talk about fact-checking or when we assess political statements, speeches, political programs. And um, I would say there are at least several dimensions to assessing such political statements. First is simple, whether they correspond to facts, let's say statistics. If someone is saying unemployment is decreasing in our country, it's easy to check. You look into statistics available, whether national, Eurostat, or other sources, IMF, various institutions, provide statistical data and you can check easily whether the statement is correct or not. These are probably the easiest things to do and I suppose you will be talking most, mostly about such type of uh, fact-checking. Uh, but there are other dimensions which I think are also very important. Uh, the second one, whether what politicians say represent a consistent program. Again, if you listen to Donald Trump, you will hear a lot of contradictory statements. Even in a single speech, he can say many things that contradict uh, each other. Uh, and this is, of course, not a, the, the issue of only Donald Trump. A lot of politicians tend to contradict themselves. Uh, the most popular example is probably in economic policy making when there is very clear tendency again to promise a lot of good things which involve spending from the budget but at the same time not saying how you will finance them or even at the same time promising to reduce taxes. So you reduce taxes but at the same time you promise to increase funding for education, funding for culture, funding for healthcare, all these nice things that voters might like and might vote for you. And, and this is again very, very common issue. So I think it's important also to look whether there is consistency in what we hear from those uh, who are active in politics. Third and related dimension is whether they are correct about the effects of their decisions, whether they are correct in terms of causal relations of what they propose. Again, very often we can hear how many new jobs will be created uh, if, if a particular politician will be elected, how average salary will increase. We in Lithuania now have a lot of numbers proposed by political parties. 
uh, very concrete numbers, how many new jobs will be created, how many uh, of those that emigrated from Lithuania will come back, uh, all these things, but again, do these things depend only on political decisions? No, of course not. Uh, they are an outcome of, first of all, individuals, us, uh, how we decide in our lives. Pol politicians can only have indirect effect on a lot of these things. So we, again, should have in mind that uh, they often tend to exaggerate, uh, especially talking about positive economic effects of uh, their policies. And fourth important dimension, how actual policies are implemented. You can have very well-intentioned politicians, you can have decisions being made which correspond to what they promised, correspond to their programs, but actual implementation might make everything wrong, might change the initial intentions, implementation of public policies. It was started in the early 70s, and actually I want to read you the full title of the book by two American political scientists, Pressman and Wildavsky, who first did a very detailed study about how policies are practically implemented. The short title is Implementation, but I will read you full title and you will, you will see the point that these political scientists uh, were making how great expectations, uh, the start of the title, how great expectations in Washington are dashed in Oakland, or why it's amazing that federal programs work at all. This being a saga of the Economic Development Administration as told by two sympathetic observers who seek to build morals on foundations. So, what they mean is it's amazing that anything gets done at all in politics when you take into account all the complex process that starts from actual decision in, in the Congress, in the Parliament, and follows through the whole process up to the street-level bureaucracy, where concrete people have to implement those concrete laws, uh, policy decisions. And during this process, a lot gets distorted, gets changed from the initial intentions. So I think this is also a very important dimension of uh, fact-checking where the initial intentions, where the election promises, other uh, political declar declarations actually achieved what was promised uh, to people. And we will see that often this is not the case. Or if something is achieved, uh, it's not because of uh, uh, what politicians decided and what they take credit for. Finally, I think we should also be realistic about uh, the importance of uh, fact-finding evidence uh, in, in political life and the impact of what we do, what you do as journalists, what we do as political analysts on voters' behavior. Voters decide when they vote not just on the basis of uh, our analysis, our reporting. When they vote, they are affected by various factors party, loyalty. Some people, let's say in Lithuania again, you can hear from voters of conservative party that they voted for this party for 25 years and they will continue to vote for this party no matter what happens, no matter what uh, this party does. So there is sometimes simple party loyalty. It doesn't matter if you discover that members of this party are lying in public some voters would still ignore this. Uh, I mean, we have uh, voters that vote consistently for, for about 10 years for Labour Party, which has been involved in a number of corruption scandals. Uh, and still, they, they get enough votes to have a faction in the parliament and quite a big number of seats in the parliament. So, it's not just information that is important. Uh, party loyalty, national, ethnic identity, social, uh, stratification, political, personal sympathies, uh, or actually anger and protest against uh, what, what is perceived as being elitist politics is also important. We see that again in the US, a lot of anger uh, that is used by, by uh, some presidential candidates. 
we saw a very interesting process in Great Britain uh, in the uh, referendum campaign on Brexit. And actually, this raised a lot of questions about the evidence and fact, uh, fact uh, importance of fact-finding in such campaigns like Brexit referendum. You know, they were consistently uh, incorrect, or let's say or simply lies, being told by those who uh, favored leaving European Union. The most famous example is probably 350 million pounds uh, being paid to the EU every week. Uh, and it has been proven that this is an uh, incorrect number. Maximum it is 190 million pounds when you take into account British rebate plus what Britain gets back from, from the EU in terms of various payments. So a lot of such uh, untrue things were said during Brexit campaign. Still, uh, we saw that uh, almost 52% of all voters voted uh, to leave the EU. This decision was initially explained as a result of badly informed public. But the surprising thing is if we look into the current research, the most recent, let's say, sociological surveys, uh, in early August, one uh, opinion poll was made by YouGov uh, company. And interestingly, 52% of people that were questioned in Great Britain still think that it was the right decision to leave the EU. So almost the same number as those who voted uh, for leaving, despite all the economic uh, uncertainties, all the market turbulences that followed a uh, referendum out outcome. Again, if we look into Eurostat data, we, we will see that the level of awareness about the European Union does not explain whether people like you or not. So there are surveys which uh, tell us uh, interesting things, that uh, it's not the lack of information or being uh, told lies uh, that affect people's decision. And I think we, we should be aware of this uh, when we talk about that. But to end, I, I still think that uh, analyzing, uh, checking whether we hear true statements or, or outright lies being told to us by those whom we elect to make decisions uh, in the politics is extremely important. And more educated voters are less likely they are to, to be, uh, be led by anger, emotions, or other factors in making their decisions during the elections. So I wish you an interesting, productive debate. Uh, enjoy your time in Vilnius, enjoy your time here at our institute, and again, thanks to initiators of this event and, and our partners. Have a good day. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the uh, U.S. Embassy uh, for not only for this event, but basically for, for the general support of Lithuanian journalists. I mean, we had really great opportunities to participate in many uh, very interesting seminars and to travel abroad, so it was very useful. And right now I want to introduce uh, U.S. Embassy in Lithuania, Public Affairs Officer uh, Heather Steele. And Steele, and please, <laughs> stage is yours. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you to the Digicom Net Forum, Truth Matters, and I love that name, that's a great name, um, sponsored by the U.S. State Department. Uh, the State Department has a long tradition of supporting the development and professionalism of journalists across the world. I've seen the impact of this support uh, during my career with the State Department, and so I'm pleased that one of my first duties as the American Embassy's new public affairs officer is to address this distinguished group this morning. I admit I may be biased in favor of the journalism profession because I earned my bachelor's degree in journalism, although I have never worked as a uh, practicing journalist. But the principles I learned in college have stayed with me, and I have a deep appreciation for the vital role credible journalism plays in a successful democracy. And factual information is crucial in developing credible journalism. This is where you and this forum come in. All journalists face a daunting challenge in carrying out their jobs, but you face an additional challenge, namely powerful propaganda and disinformation. The best response to this is not more propaganda 
but rather factual, truthful information. Unfortunately, the truth has a lot of competition, especially when it comes to political reporting. The truth isn't always as entertaining or politically useful as fiction or half-truths. For this reason, the act of fact-checking is a crucial aspect of credible journalism. Journalists must hold themselves to high standards. You must be above politics, entertainment, and other influences that might seek to cheapen information. If we think of information as a form of currency, factual information is the most valuable. I thank you for dedicating your valuable time to be here this weekend. I admire your commitment to this endeavor, and I hope that you find this forum worthwhile. And I want to introduce uh, Director of Eastern European Studies Center, is Linas Koyala, uh, who will have a little bit longer talk. I think it will be really interesting. I mean, yes, we are in Lithuania. Lithuania is really in the uh, inter interesting region in the center and Eastern Europe, so we have to really be aware of, us, of what's going on here. So I hope it will be uh, really interesting. Stage is yours. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. It's, it's my institute. I'm still studying here, so it's always a pleasure to be at home. And I will try to be the one who will uh, give you some questions, give you some thoughts about what you will discuss during the whole event and during the workshops about the truth and politics. And I would like to start with a quote, with a quote of uh, a famous German who was saying in the last century that we moderns explain uncertainty and falseness as a symptom of the horror which seized men when at the end of an era of an apparent victory and success, they found themselves suddenly confronting a void. Great material scarcity, a period of political and military crisis, and an accelerating distrust of the intellectual itself, of its own virtue, dignity, and even of its own existence. So we should not take anything for granted, Hesse tells us, because sudden and unexpected changes might happen very rapidly. And it's a part of reality which we might also live in. And intellect is almost always a victim or at least a target of these endeavors. Totalitarian regimes in the 20th century in Europe are an example of that. According to Karl Popper, which we read very much here in the Institute, the most powerful bulwark against totalitarianism is shared belief in the neutral principles of science and inquiry. Reason, as Popper notes, is a language accessible to all. If collective faith in reason is absent, very little stands in the way of the gratifying fantasy or dreadful nightmare that populists forge for wrong voters' hopes and fears. And yet today we see that more and more politicians, or at least they became more vocal and influential, are not talking about the truth. They're saying what their electorate wants to hear, what the pe people being in some conferences or in events want to hear, and they're not try even trying to talk about politics. And PolitiFact, uh, so you, are saying that only 15% of the theses made by Donald Trump during his election campaign are true, or partly true. So less are true, well, more are partly true. Even because of it, Hillary Clinton is 25% of the, her statements are also at least partly false. So in that sense, we see that most of the politicians, not only populists, are having a problem with telling the truth. So we are probably entering the era which is already coined by one famous uh, political analyst, especially in the United States, but also in Great Britain, as post-truth politics. So we are talking in this conference that truth matters. But on the other hand, we are seeing uh, different di changing circumstances which push, push us towards a new kind of political environment, an environment in which truth does not matter. And probably Trump is the most prominent example of that. We will be quoting Trump for the whole days, I think. Because when I look at him, it doesn't seem to be matter what he's talking about. The emotions are the most important thing. He might be saying things which are completely false, but in the end, he becomes effective by saying those things that people want to hear. So in this sense, they are repeating and repeating some talking points which are influential and not disturbing themselves about the truth. 
And that becomes a responsibility of others to say that some theses or some arguments or even some emotions are false. But then you hear from the people who are listening to those politicians. And again, I will quote a woman in a Trump's rally which was arguing with the journalist, well not arguing, but maybe discussing with the, uh, with the journalist and saying, we are always talking about those facts. If it's a negative in itself, talking about facts, because facts might be unpatriotic, they are pessimistic, and they might make you feel bad. So we are probably, or at least partly, entering an era of post-truth politics, when different uh, arguments matter. And yes, there are many examples of that. Professor Wilkoszalski has already mentioned one of it, the 350 million pounds a week that UK has to pay for being in EU, subsidizing poor countries in Eastern and Central Europe. And even though everyone knew, not everyone probably, but most of the people knew it's a false fact, still the buses rode around London and still it played an important part in the referendum campaign. Another example which I like very much is The Sun, a very prominent newspaper in, in Great Britain, even though in most cases it has problems with being truthful, saying that Queen backs Brexit. And it doesn't matter that later the Queen denied that she backs Brexit. She remained neutral in that referendum campaign. But this uh, paper published a news story which was of course false or just an interpretation of some facts which could be very much discussed whether they are true or false and that played an important part of course during the campaign. So truth matters but in the end we are not playing with truthful arguments. US and Trump is another good example, just two of them that I like very much myself, that Obama is a founder of ISIS. Very much repeated argument by Trump, even though denied, of course, not, there's nothing to deny in this, in this kind of argument, but still he's saying it and repeating it, and it sometimes becomes at least a partly true in some people's minds. Might, might be he a founder of ISIS, might he co contributed to the foundation of this terrorist organization. Uh, another one is that Trump opposed war in Iraq. Nobody heard him saying that, at least nobody found facts, arguments, theses, which could not be denied, that he said so before the war began. On, on the contrary, there are some arguments which, in which he was saying that the war in Iraq is a good war and that U.S. should pursue it. But he's still saying it and put, putting himself in a confrontation against Hillary Clinton and saying that she voted for war in Iraq. And that he gives him, certainly gives him some votes or at least some popularity among people who are against U.S. interventionism abroad. Second hypothesis, or it may be an argument because it will be based on some facts, uh, as I will show you, that there is a total lack of trust, especially in institutions, in various institutions, both governmental, non-governmental, non businesses and media all around the globe. I will quote just a couple of uh, researchers. One of them is not done by Edelman uh, agency, if you could say so. And it shows that global decline it, it trust, in trust is gathering pace. This is the trust in institutions, in governmental institutions, in media, in businesses, and in NGOs. So we see that people, of course, uh, I have a newer uh, barometer of this year, and it shows a slight increase of trust, but I used uh, like Trump, the, the arguments which are more beneficial for my presentation. So we see the decline in trust, a rapid decline in trust in those institutions. And it's a global phenomenon. There are 27 countries in this research, only 27 from various uh, parts of the globe, but in the end we see that the tendencies are very negative. And of course we can find other arguments as well. For example, in the United States, the trust in the federal institutions and in the government is decreasing and quite rapidly, as we see from 60s to today, uh, the decrease is very rapid and we say that Trump's popularity is probably uh, partly uh, explained by this fact. Mistrust in institutions, distrust in institutions plays a part in people being angry and seeking other solutions. But it's not only a phenomenon in the US, of course. 
in European Union and face the same problems as well. Even though we do not have European government, uh, sovereign government, which could be compared to federal government in the US, even though European Commission has some supranational rights, but we see that 60% of Europeans distrust their national governments, national institutions. Most of them are not interested in politics at all, so not playing a part in the decision-making procedures as an electorate or as an active citizens. Most of the Europeans say that Europe is going into the wrong direction and trust in European Union and its various institutions is also not increasing. Even though financial crisis seems to be at least partly over, not in South maybe of Europe, but at least in most of Europe it's over, the decrease of trust remains relatively stable. So when you are having uh, a mistrust or distrust uh, of institutions, when you do not believe in the government, of course, politics of not truth may prevail. But another factor which is very interesting for me is representation. In politics, we are talking that democracy is most representative political system because people can vote and choose who represent them in governmental institutions. And yet again, looking at the United States, we see an interesting phenomenon that both political parties have nominees for presidential positions who are very unpopular among public. So who are they representing? Are they representing anyone? Because if you have record levels of distrust in both of these politicians who are representing the biggest political parties in a democratic system, then of course you have a problem. There are various similar graphs which you can find in European Union or in European Union countries. So it's not an American phenomenon, but still it's an interesting phenomenon. Do we have a representation in our political systems which people regard as truly representative? Third hypothesis, argument, or thesis is that media habits are changing and we see some phenomenons, of course also or by opinion pools, that people less and less think about mass media and traditional media sources as the main sources of information, less than before. Of course, they are still the main sources for many of the people, but uh, online search engines and even probably more, more important, various social networks, Twitter, Facebook and others, are becoming more prominent as sources of information. People only need to log on their accounts on Facebook or on Twitter to get all the information they need about politics, about economics, about football, soccer, or any other area of their interests. And this personalization on the internet could create, according to some observers, a filter bubbles within which people see only what fits their existing views. So you follow some people, you follow some politicians, which you like, you have their argumentation, you have some sources of information that you like, and you are in a filter or in a bubble of information in which not the truth matters, but the things that you like to hear matters. So this might become a problem, because in the end, if you live in such a bubble, you might not see what's outside of it, even though it's, what's outside of it might be the reality. And still, there is another problem. You can log on to your Facebook account in 5 seconds or 10 seconds. You can access any sort of information freely in just a couple of minutes. But in the end, you see that young people, those who should be deciding their faith, and they are saying that they are deciding their, their futures, are not interested in what's happening around the world. And I think that Brexit is a good example, because after the Brexit votes came out and the results became obvious, people went out to the streets saying that, well, older generation voted for us. They decided for us, but they will not live in future of Great Britain outside of the EU. So this is a bad decision. We should have maybe a second referendum or etc. But looking at numbers and seeing that only one third of young people up to 24 years old voted poses a problem in itself. Because people does not seem to be interested or active even in such a controversial matter which gained prominence in all of the media outlets in Great Britain for at least a year. So it's a big problem. And it's also a problem in the United States as well, because we see that as we are looking at younger generations, there is less and less interest in what's happening around the world. 
or at what's happening in domestic politics. And think for yourself, because I'm sometimes thinking about it, how many people do you know who are well educated, who earn quite a lot, they may be working in uh, hospitals, maybe working in banks, maybe working in businesses, who are not interested in what's happening, what's around them in politics or international politics, who are not maybe familiar with Syria, with Ukraine, with NATO, with other issues which are directly influencing their lives or might directly influence their lives. So not being interested while having all the opportunities to get all the information you need, it's also a problem. And it also contributes to the post truth politics. Fourth hypothesis, um, growing gap between the elites and non-elites. It's well, famous populist, any populist in the world would say that I am against the elites. Those bad elites are playing with your lives and you cannot influence their decision-making procedures, you cannot influence what they decide behind closed doors. Hillary Clinton is telling some speeches for uh, Wall Street uh, bankers and not publishing what, what, what was being said during those speeches. So what can you expect from her as a political leader? You can only expect, expect corruption and elite decision-making but not representation of your interest. And yes, there is a growing division and this uh, graph shows it because there is, and we're coming back to the question of trust, a gap of trust between the people who are well informed, those are college educated, who say that they are following media extensively and who are at least a bit richer, and between those who are less interested. And there is a big gap. And this gap also plays a part in strengthening those politicians who are playing with emotions. And it's a global phenomenon. As I'm talking mostly about Trump and United States and Brexit as a, an example of United Kingdom's recent decision, we also see that there is big gaps, biggest gaps actually in this research, research of 27 countries uh, between uh, elites and informed public, which we could say are elites, and those who are general public less interested in political phenomena. And this is an accelerating disparity. This gap is growing. And this is the newest graph, so I'm not making this up or trying to play with the years and different researches. So this gap is increasing, so the problem is not only here for today, but it's probably here for the future. There is also a link to the income, it's just a graph for, for, for fun, not maybe directly uh, with regard to my presentation, but there is a link with the income, so those who are earning more are tending to be trusting the institutions more. And finally, the fifth hypothesis. We have similarities of these two very different phenomena. Well, of course, we're talking about countries which have the same language and etc. some similarities in, in history. But there is also an interesting similarities in two different political processes. One is voting for Trump and one and another is voting for Brexit. So, for example, we can find that those people who voted for Brexit and those people who vote or at least voted in the primaries at least we do not have sufficient data of, of Trump voter, voters yet but we have some fresh information about the primaries so we see that those people who are against globalization or think that globalization is a bad phenomenon or think that globalization is making their lives worse than before tend to vote for these two political phenomena, Trump and Brexit also, those people tend to be older and male. In both cases, we see the similar tendencies that if you are male and if you are white male in the United States and if you are a bit older, then you would probably be more likely to vote for Trump. The same in Britain, if you are older, not necessarily male, but also males were more prominent leave campaigners, you tend to be for Brexit. And th these kind of observations seem to push for a conclusion that those people who vote for Trump and those people who vote for Brexit, and of course it's a silly explanation, it's not an explanation at all, might be just poor, they're not rich enough, and they might be just stupid because there is also talk about their education. The less educated you are, the less likely you vote for those two political phenomena. And it's a very easy explanation. You're poor and stupid, and I'm smart and I know what's happening. 
and I'm deciding rightly and you're deciding wrongly. But it's probably not right to say that. Even though some data would contribute to this argument, and we see that in uh, Britain there is a correlation between income and voting for Brexit or against Brexit, the richer you are, the more likely you would vote for Brexit. But for example, in the US, at least some first researchers show that those who vote for Trump earn quite a lot. They are not very poor. They earn even more than an average. <coughs> Of course, this is a, just a fresh data. We will look at this for years and years to come. But you cannot say that it's a simple explanation which can explain everything. And also about uh, education. Yes, there is also a correlation between education levels and voting for Brexit in, in Britain. If you have a degree, most likely, as we see, uh, almost 70% voted for remain. While if you do not have high school degree, most probably voted for leave. But it's still, we're talking about millions of people, both in Britain and even more so in the US, who have a degree or education and they still vote for Trump. So it's probably that poor and stupid explanation should not be used by the elites because it will only grow this kind of division. And some conclusions, not conclusions, but some remarks at the very end. So, Truth is neglected, populism is prevailing, and we are living in some sort of post-truth politics or post-truth environment. We might be living in it, we might be entering it, we might just enter it, it's just a part of a discussion, but there is some phenomenon which is growing and it's, it's very interesting because it has direct influence on the future of our states. There is a strong fight against experts. Experts are not needed anymore. We are talking for ourselves. And we are not talking to the public because public do not need facts anymore and rational argumentation is not essential for a successful political campaign. Division between elites and non-elites are growing. And there is a perception or, or a difference or a division or a gap between the perceptions of realities among most of the people, the general public and the elites. And sometimes we have a problem which, is not being, which was not discussed during my presentation. When people are talking, for example, about the GDP growth, and experts are saying that economy is growing, that you are getting richer, but people are not feeling it. So this division of perception is also playing a part in making the gap between political elites, or not, not political elites, but elites and non-elites bigger. Problem of representation arises. Maybe we should not blame the populists for being popular. We should also look for the traditional politicians why are not they making themselves representatives of public? Why they are not able to talk about the problems the people want to talk? Why they are not able to play with the facts and arguments the way that would be effective in order to influence the voters to not vote for the populists? And the only way to tackle this problem, this complex problem or problems, is probably to use different means to adapt to the situation and try to understand those people. Why are they voting and why are we entering this phase of national politics? And I will finish with the quote with which I began, with the same author, and he said all men are prepared to accomplish their incredible if their ideals are threatened. So I think I see many people who are having an ideal of truth here. So we have to adapt. We have to talk about problems because in the end, of course, those ideals will be defended for our democracies to work. Thank you very much. And we will have really interesting discussion with a really honorable guests. I think we will be able to ask questions and to participate in that discussion. So, Ginteras, microphone is yours. We're going to discuss uh, media coverage of campaigns and elections uh, and uh, specifically U.S. presidential campaign, I think. Uh, so, I'm going to do a little intro, a bit of historical background, I think, and uh, then I'm going to invite our guests to the stage, and then we're going to have some questions from the audience, I think. So, I'd like to begin by saying that everybody lies. Everybody. <laughs> and uh, it's extremely difficult to measure lying because respondents can simply lie when asked but it is said that every person lies at least a couple of times a day and I think politics is not an exception. 
uh, and lying is definitely not new in American politics. So uh, if we talk about historical background, uh, Lyndon Johnson lied about Vietnam. Ronald Reagan lied about Iran-Contra and Grenada. Bill Clinton lied about Monica Lewinsky. Hillary Clinton lied about sniper fire in Bosnia. Uh, George W. Bush administration lied about WMD. Obama withheld facts about his health care plan. So lies by politicians are probably inevitable. But truth also matters, hence the title of our event. <laughs> uh, but in fact, truth was once very fashionable in, in American journalism. Uh, I'm talking about 70s. Uh, Walter Cronkite went to Vietnam and made conclusion about the unwinnable war. And you know, journalists who reported on Watergate and numerous Senate hearings were like heroes, uh, widely read and discussed. But then, uh, as Rick Perlstein of the Washington Spectator pointed out on the, on the media show, Ronald Reagan said America was still a city on the hill still a God's chosen nation, and the whole new generation of Republicans started calling out journalists as radical liberals, professional pessimists, uh, basically degrading their authority as referees. Uh, so sometime in the 90s, maybe 94, 95, when Fox News came into, came into being, <laughs> uh, the media stopped calling lies what it is, and came to believe that they have to be balanced between uh, two ideological factions, uh, and this is obviously advantageous to the side that wants to lie more. Uh, and also it was a perfect closed system. Uh, if the press did intervene and left its false equivalency, objectivity aside, then they're biased. So uh, that's, that's what to be pessimistic maybe, but uh, I'd say the media is pushing back. Uh, if we remember previous candidates, uh, George W. Bush, Bush was funny. It was all about gaffes. Sarah Palin was funny, amazingly incompetent as well, but also funny. Uh, even even last year and uh, part of this year, uh, Donald Trump mattered more because of his gaffes. Uh, only the last half a year, maybe, uh, the media has started concentrating on his lies. I'd say. And uh, for, a while, for a while, analysts claim this will not matter, and this remains to be uh, decided. But uh, polls speak for themselves. Uh, Clinton is in clear lead, and Trump is probably heading for a predicted downfall. So, uh, with me today, facts, uh, lies, and media coverage of campaigns and elections as a whole, are Emma Lacey Bordeaux, a row editor at CNN, and as we well know, CNN is hated by Trump. So, if you don't mind, I'll call you Crooked Emma. Uh, welcome to the stage. And also, and also Patricia Maze, uh, a political writer at the Miami Herald, and uh, Florida again is a very important state in every U.S. election. So welcome to the stage, Patricia. As well. So now our guests will probably have uh, little tiny presentations for us, and uh, we can discuss and ask questions later. Uh, Emma starts. Um, I love that introduction. Everybody lies. <laughs> Um, all right, so I'm really excited to be here today with you guys. I hope you have a lot of questions. Um, I know a lot of you all have met many of you, and I hope, um, I hope we can have a really good discussion. Um, this is focused on the US elections, but um, I think there's a lot to discuss about uh, what's going on in everybody's respective countries and also in this region, too. So I hope we can do that. Um, so. got a fact and fiction campaign 2016. So we all know this has been an unusual election uh, in the United States. Um, normally the way fact checking plays out for us in the media is that a candidate says something in a public forum, this is Clinton at an ABC News debate in December. 
And so Clinton made this claim. She said, they are going to people showing videos of Donald Trump insulting Islam and Muslims in order to recruit more radical jihadists. So this was a big claim, right? She said, basically ISIS is using Trump in their propaganda videos. And this is uh, sort of a classic thing that we can fact check, right? Like it's either true or it's not. Is Trump in these videos or is he not? So we did our thing. Uh, we call ours reality check. So there we are. We ruled that it was false, that Trump didn't appear in these videos, so Clinton's claim is false. Our awesome colleagues at PolitiFact also weighed in, and they gave her a false rating too. All right, so this is like a sort of classic example of how these fact checks work, like something's true or false, and then we weigh in. And what Clinton did is she pivoted. So three days later, she's on the stump. She is in Iowa, and she gives a longer version of basically the same idea, which is that this idea that Trump um, is uh, being used, his rhetoric is being used by violent jihadists. So basically, she's still saying that the sort of subtext is still the same, but she's tweaked it because we've called her out, the media has called her out and said, look, he's not in prop these propaganda videos. So that's typically how we've seen it in elections past, right? Like a candidate says something, it's true or false, media calls them out on it. They maybe tweak it a little bit because they still want to say sort of the same, they want to make the same attack, but they tweak it so it's harder to be either yes or no, true or false, right? So um, Trump has been a little bit different. Uh, this is from a lengthy exchange that he gave to the New York Times editorial board. And this is not a typical, uh, nobody really was talking about Japan and nuclear weapons, but Trump did in this interview. Um, and basically, they went back and forth, the editorial board, and Trump basically said he's okay with Japan having nuclear weapons. So Clinton seized on that, uh, says Trump is you know, okay with Japan having nuclear weapons. Trump attacks Clinton. He says, I never said that. I never said that Japan should have nuclear weapons. So this is when we at CNN did something a little bit different. Um, typically with fact checks, they look a little bit like what you saw earlier. We give it a verdict. We give a long explanation of how we got to that verdict because we want to be transparent. We want to try to build trust, um, which as we know is, an, is, is, an, is a concern, right? So this one we did a little differently. Um, we, uh, we used our lower third, our banner, to put a Trump statement. So Trump, I never said Japan should have nukes, and then in parentheses, he did. Well, we got a little bit carried away with that one. We did it, the same banner, <laughs> several times throughout the course of that day. So this was a little bit different. Um, and we've actually done it again recently with the, the claim that Obama founded ISIS. And interestingly, um, We've, we've started getting serious pushback for that one, um, especially in conservative media. I can talk more about that if anybody's interested. But enough about the candidates. So what's really critical with the fact checks, of course, is what the voters think, because this is all in service of voters, right? I mean, this is not some abstract exercise. Like, we want voters to have the best possible information, right? So. Perception matters, and what's tough with uh, fact-checking is that sometimes it's not just yes or no, true or false. Sometimes it's a bigger issue that people have embedded feelings about, right? So a big one is crime. So um, the U.S. has, since 94, seen a steadily decreasing crime rate. That's good news. But what's interesting is Americans don't actually feel that crime is decreasing. Um, so as you can see, in the same time period, roughly the same time period that crime is decreasing, Americans are actually, when asked, say that they think it's increasing. So this trend is continuing, um, by the way. There's a, there's, it may be different this year, we'll have to see. There's some indication that murders are up in big cities, but the, the important issue is this issue of perception because when somebody, a candidate, then says something about crime and we do a fact check in the media, we aren't just 
contending with the statistics, we're continuing, contending with those feelings that people have about crime, right? So we talked about um, you know, the trust deficit in the last presentation, and I'm really glad we did because the media has this problem, right? So this is in the US, this is Gallup, a great uh, polling institution. So 40, only 40% 40 of Americans trust, trust us. <laughs> That's not great. <laughs> and so this is something else that we contend with when we're doing uh, the fact checking because, you know, um, in, a, in a typical news story, right, you have characters, they're doing something, you have a whole picture. With a fact check, it's kind of all stripped away, right? Like you don't have a bigger narrative necessarily, it's just is this true or is it false? And if people don't trust the media, then are they going to trust fact checks, you know? And that's something that we need to, to think about. So uh, Russia Today also saw that Gallup poll. <laughs> and uh, they helpfully included a picture of my colleague there. <laughs> um, but the, the interesting thing, and we also touched on this in the last presentation, is this fact checking is not really the realm of just broadcast and print any longer, right? So we all know that people are getting more and more news from social media. And there's, um, there's cool new fact-checking things online. Snopes, of course, is not new. It's been around for ages. And they, um, they look at email forwards, and then they also look at political stuff sometimes, too. Um, Gawker in the United States has something they call antiviral, which uh, tries to take on things that have gone viral and decide whether or not they're true or false. I heard a good example of something that went viral in Georgia recently that was not true. So, I mean, there's lots of that, right? This one I really like. This is, um, this is a Twitter account that is devoted to finding fake pictures of things that happen in space. So, if you're an astronaut fan, you know, follow them, fake astro pics. And then, this one I like too. So, Face Crooks is devoted, um, I haven't really seen them, they're sort of new, I think. They look at um, things on Facebook exclusively that are false. So, you know, there are things that are happening, um, but then when, when we look at social media, this was also touched upon, there's this issue of what, what information are we getting from our social media feeds? So the Wall Street Journal, um, and I don't know whether Brian, who's here, I don't know whether he actually may have put this together, but I love it. So what they did was they took um, what a liberal Facebook feed looks like and a conservative Facebook feed. And you can play with this on their website if you're interested. But you can see just how quickly people's feeds get filtered. And then this feeds into the crime perception problem, right? Like, if people are only reading these things, then this solidifies their perception, which is all something that you're contending with in the fact checks. So where does this leave us? Um, <laughs> In an interesting place, I think. Um, now, uh, full disclosure, this guy, Peter Dow, he worked for Clinton, so he's not a neutral observer. But he's saying, you know, this is, th this is where we are in the United States. Media organizations are fact-checking whether or not uh, Barack Obama, our president, <laughs> founded a terrorist organization. Um, so I think we're in an interesting moment. I think there are signs to be hopeful. You know, there's new platforms. Snapchat, especially, I think, has a lot of really interesting things. And I think it's incumbent upon us in the media to work on these issues of trust and trying, trying new things and meeting people where they are. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing what you all have to say. And uh, that is the end of my PowerPoint. Thank you, Emma. <laughs> All right. Where is this? Play. Hi. Hi. My name is A. Can you hear me? Um, I work at the Miami Herald, which is a newspaper, so I come at this from the print and online perspective. Um, and I am not a fact checker. I am a political reporter, so my job is to cover the presidential campaign. Um, and mostly it began covering Marco Rubio and Jeb Bush when they were running for the Republican nomination because they're both from Miami. As a regional newspaper, we don't have to cover every big national story. We cover things at a regional level for our readers. 
And um, so you will see that in my examples, there's a lot of Republican stories, and that's because I've mostly covered the Republican side until um, March or so, um, because that's where my hometown candidates were. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about what it's like to report on this very unusual election uh, on a day-to-day -day basis when you're not taking time out to check a particular fact, but you're trying to give your readers the flavor of the campaign trail for most people don't ever get to go to a political rally or a speech. So what is that like? And when you know someone is saying something that is not true, how can you say that in a story without it being a fact check story, but you still have it in your story, kind of what Emma was talking about of when they put it on TV on their banner. How do we do that in our stories? Um, and how do we ask questions that reveal new truths about the candidates, especially when you're in a local market, and hopefully this will apply to some of your own coverage, uh, where you have interests for your readers that maybe are not interests that anybody else is touching on during the campaign. Um, and that is the essential question, right? How do we tell the story of 2016? And I'm happy to talk about Florida politics a little later if you're interested, but uh, as by way of background, Florida um, is the nation, uh, the U.S.'s largest swing state which means uh, that is going to be one of the biggest battlegrounds between Trump and Clinton. The polls show them uh, virtually tied, uh, maybe Clinton slightly ahead, but it is viewed as one of the states that Trump could pick up um, if he uh, has a bigger kind of organization that is still we, we haven't seen and, and time is running out for him there. But uh, Florida is a very unusual state in that it is like five states in one. Uh, the, the southeast where Miami is, is like the northeast of the United States, like New York. Uh, the southwest is like the Midwest of the United States, like Chicago. The north part of Florida is like the south of the United States, like Atlanta. Um, and then the middle where Orlando is uh, changes depending on each election. So we, we essentially have five states in one, and that's what makes it very interesting to cover politics there. I'm going to start with uh, my first Donald Trump rally, which was in Las Vegas uh, last October. And this is the first time that I saw him in person and that I thought he is really having the kind of traction that a winning candidate can have. I had been to debates, I had seen him um, on a debate stage, but I had not seen the rallies. And the rallies are important to share with our readers because you, if you are not a Trump supporter, you might not relate to somebody who is a Trump supporter. And um, a little bit of what I try to do in this story is set the scene for our readers in Miami, which is there was a very long line out the door hours before he got there in a casino in Las Vegas. And tourists are asking, are there more tickets? Can we get in? And that is a first sign that there is a phenomenon because most political events are, are boring, to be honest with you. And this was like a show, like people were trying to get into a show. And then you talk to his supporters. And here is a supporter saying, you know, I am tired of what the country has become. I'm tired of political correctness. If you don't like America, get the hell out. And we, you know, we don't use that kind of language usually in the newspaper unless somebody says it. And when somebody says it, you have to quote it. You can't, uh, you can't whitewash what people say. You can't make it nicer. When they say, if you don't like America, get the hell out, that is a feeling that people have. And you have to be able to tell that in your stories and reflect it uh, because it's real. And so that's, when we talk about truth, I guess I'm speaking in, in not in a fact-checking manner, but this is the truth of people who have a certain point of view and we have to reflect it in the newspaper. And this is again in October of last year and look at what Trump said at this rally. He said, um, the media never shows us, never shows our crowds. And the people started booing and turning around to the cameras and saying, show the crowd, you know, pan the room. And we kept seeing that for months and months, but it wasn't new just because it happened again, you know, last month. It, it, he's been doing it for months. And again, you have to show that uh, because it's so unusual, a candidate saying, pointing at the cameras and saying, this is what's wrong with you. Um, here's another way we've been trying to cover this election. His first trip to Miami to a place called Doral where he has a golf course. Uh, to give you an idea, Doral is a very Hispanic city. 
Uh, it is full of Venezuelans and Colombians uh, who have moved to Miami. And so we decided to interview the Hispanic Trump supporters because there is an assumption that maybe he doesn't have many because he said that some Mexicans who go into the US might be criminals or rapists. So how could any Hispanics vote for him? And here we have, I love Donald Trump. Um, he is our only hope in this country. He's telling the truths about the problems in this country. And she said, I'm a legal immigrant. But when you ask her where she came from, she said, I came from Nicaragua, I came in 1979. Well, you can't just put that in the story and, and let the person not tell the rest of the truth. And the rest of the truth is, you were a legal immigrant because there was an amnesty program for refugees that Jimmy Carter put in place. Um, and so we added that to the story. We said, okay, she's calling herself a legal immigrant, but the reason she's a legal immigrant is because there was an action by a politician that let her be legal. Otherwise, she would have been illegal. So these are ways that we try, like I said, we're not fact-checking the voter, um, but we are trying to tell people the fuller story. There was a time when Marco Rubio and Donald Trump were having an exchange uh, that was very unusual in politics. Uh, Marco Rubio called Donald Trump a con man, um, and Donald Trump called Marco Rubio a choker because he had a very bad debate um, against Chris Christie in New Hampshire. And it got to the point where Marco Rubio was reading Donald Trump's tweets at a rally, which you can see when he's holding a phone where he was reading the tweets. And Donald Trump is throwing a water bottle to make fun of the time that Marco Rubio had to drink water on national TV. And years ago, I mean, like, to us, this was absolutely absurd, right? And it got to the point where Marco Rubio started questioning why, it, whether Donald Trump was uh, someone who was wetting his pants. You know, not usual language, again, that you would see in a newspaper, but this is what it had come to. So how do you report that? You were, you're covering a campaign, it's serious business, it's the President of the United States. We have to have a little fun with it. I mean, if it's absurd, your writing, in my opinion, should reflect that absurdity. So this is a line I had to write in my story. Behold what the Republican presidential election has become to try to take down Trump, one of his chief opponents, acted just like him. Um, he started questioning the size of his hands, um, which of course had other physical implications. And so, you know, this is the challenge of the reporter. How do you, how do you deal with that? Do you just treat it like a normal news story? And you see with our headline, we, we didn't so much. We outlined um, how unusual it was. This is uh, the point that I was getting to about asking questions that reveal new truths about the candidates. So Ben Carson was in Miami promoting uh, his book. He was still a presidential candidate, but he was on a book tour. Again, not your typical election. Normally a candidate would not take time off to go promote their book. And when you're in Miami, we have to ask you about Cuba because we have the largest population of Cubans outside of Cuba. Um, US-Cuba policy is incredibly important to our readers. And candidates aren't asked that in Iowa. You know, because in Iowa, they don't usually, maybe in Iowa, because of agriculture policy, they care a little more. But in New Hampshire, they don't ask them about Cuba. So we asked Ben Carson about Cuba, and he didn't know about Cuba. And you have to report that the candidate just isn't prepared to answer the questions that are important to your community. And so, um, he, to his credit, he acknowledged that he didn't know. We asked him about the US policy, and uh, he said, I've not been briefed fully on what that is. Again, we're telling truths, we're not calling them false, liar, unprepared, but we are telling our readers this is what happened. They weren't able to answer questions. You may, you be the judge of that. Maybe you don't expect a candidate to know about Cuba policy, but when they're in Miami, it's an important point. And you would think the candidates would learn from each other's mistakes, but not so much. Bernie Sanders came to Miami. Bernie Sanders could not answer questions about Cuba. Um, and he got a little bit upset that we kept asking him about it. And he said, I just don't know all the details about that. And I think it's incumbent on us to report that as well. It's not just the truth or the false or what they said or they didn't say. When they don't know, we have to call them out on it if that's something that matters to our readers. This is not a gotcha. This is not a political question about their character and their personal lives. It's about policy set by the president. So this matters. Here, we have another important Miami issue, if you've heard 
Um, the climate is warming, according to science, and Miami is on the front lines of this because we are underwater. Uh, the city of Miami Beach has had to raise its streets and its sidewalks in order to deal with the rising water from below. And we had to write a story that said Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio basically don't um, fully embrace the science of climate change. And these guys are from Miami, and so it's hard sometimes when you're the local reporters to have to say your, your hometown candidates um, are not acknowledging scientific evidence that affects your local community. But if we don't call them out on it, who will? And so we had this headline, and we pointed out that they both live 15 miles away from where this is happening, uh, where the streets are getting raised, which millions of public dollars are getting spent. And they say things like, I don't have a plan to influence the weather. Or they say things like, it wouldn't be on my first page of things to wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat. And so here comes the paragraph that they didn't like, which said, they don't sound much worried about one of their hometown's most pressing environmental problems. Again, this is not a fact check. Um, you can, we're not taking a statement that they said about the weather and saying this is true or false. We're putting it in context for people and saying they're from Miami, they're living it, but they don't want to talk about it. Climate change also came up with Trump. He, um, he gave us an interview last week. The headline is about Guantanamo, but we mentioned we were in Miami Beach. We said, you're in Miami Beach, the streets are going up, you're a developer, you know about infrastructure, you know about public spending on streets and pipes. What do you think about climate change? And he said, I'm not a big believer in man-made climate change. Um, and then we had to add, despite vast scientific evidence to the contrary. Um, there could be some impact, he said, but he doesn't believe it's devastating impact. Um, and then we had to add, he has called climate change a hoax. And that link is actually a link to a PolitiFact where, where they said, well, it's not a hoax. Um, and you can't be, you know, if, if people aren't trusting us and they're not gonna read our same fact check 30 times, this is how we've tried to incorporate that truth into our writing is saying, well, he's saying he doesn't believe in it, but there is vast evidence to the contrary. So we're just reminding our readers, you have to, most voters have to hear things, I think some studies have shown, don't fact check me on this, uh, that they have to hear things 10 times at least before it sticks in their heads. Well, the same is true with news. You have to remind them every time. It doesn't just go away. And then in that same interview, uh, Trump was in Miami, and I'm going to add the same example everybody has used, which is about the founding of ISIS. How did we deal that in, I mean, we, didn't, we weren't gonna do a whole story about how it wasn't true because the fact checkers were doing that, but he kept repeating it. So we added in our story, he stuck by his completely unfounded assertion from the night before that Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama are the founders of ISIS. Now, he keeps repeating it, and so we have this dilemma. Do we, do we keep writing about it just because he keeps saying it? It's still not true. Um, is it worse to repeat it because you're kind of prolonging a, a, an untruth or do we not write about it? I fall on the side of if a candidate for the presidency is saying it, you kind of have a duty to report it. You can't pretend it's not there. Uh, but this is how we chose to write about it. And then you will see he was talking to a conference and it wasn't a rally, it wasn't a bunch of Trump supporters and they were completely silent. Um, and so then they started laughing when he said that. And so it is unclear if the laughter from the crowd indicated people thought he was joking. Because you, you're sitting there, you don't know. Are people laughing because they think it's funny, but it's, they know it's not real? Um, the reaction of the crowd matters too, I think, because it tells you where the voters are on that particular issue. Um, so these are, I, I wanted to share these examples because I think it's been a difficult election to cover uh, in terms of, of the unusual candidacy of Trump and the disliked candidacy of Clinton. Um, and I think we'd like to mostly take your questions now because however this, since it's a room full of journalists, yes. ha however this applies to your real work, uh, if we can help and talk about that, we would like that very much. So thank you. Yeah, so if, if, yeah, if you have questions, just go on and we'll pass the mic. Yeah, here you go. Hey, 
Hello, thank you for the interesting presentations. I am Katie Bojgu, a journalist from Georgia TV Medi. I wanted to ask about the um, fact checking mostly because uh, what concerns me is uh, when we cover uh, the things that candidates say, for example, Trump says, and then uh, we fact check it and show it to the people, at the end of the day, we get more Trump and more bullshit that he says. So, do we have the result, what we want to achieve, or maybe uh, we are doing worse fact -check, through fact-checking? Thank you. Uh, I think that's, I think that's a, an interesting question. I mean, what I would say is that, um, from our perspective, our, um, our responsibility is, uh, as Pat was saying, these are these are people who are running for president. They've said something. Um, our responsibility is to present what we know to the public so that they can make a decision. So our motivation hasn't been, and I don't know that it can be, worried about what what voters are then going to do, or even the, the, the public is going to do with that information. You know, it's, I think we see our role as we're going we're gonna to present the truth as we know it. Right, we're not going to interpret it for you as to whether that means you should like it or not. And we're also not going to count whether we're going to have more of one or more of the other. I mean, you want a fair amount of balance for us in a print newspaper on the front page. You're not going to put the same kind of on the front page every day. That would be OK. But if there's a candidate who's campaigning in your community a lot and the other one is not, you know, is that promoting the candidate? That's not my problem. You know, that they're there, we're covering them. That is the news. Uh, now, uh, there was a lot of criticism early on in the campaign of how much Trump was in the media. And I think some of that criticism is valid in terms of covering his rallies live on TV and things like that. But the other side of that is he was doing interviews. Are we going to say no to a presidential candidate doing interviews? And if the other candidate doesn't want to do any interviews, why should he suffer because she doesn't give interviews? Um, there, there is one thing that Trump has shown is that if you make news, you will be covered by the news. And he would give a press conference every time he won a primary. Hillary Clinton hasn't given a press conference since December. You know, we're going to cover the press conference. There will be news. and. To say we're covering it too much, well, he is saying new things and he is answering questions. So that is going to get covered. And, and he showed that that was a way to get on TV without buying advertising. So maybe that's a new way to campaign for future candidates. Maybe that only applies to Trump. But if other candidates want to learn something from that, I think it would be, you know, answer the phone. Give an interview and you'll get coverage for it. My name is Mikko Sala, I'm representing here a Finnish Facting Checking Service and our European Project Fact Bar. Uh, but um, I had a chance to visit UK, uh, US in, um, in uh, February and March, and I saw colleagues and struggling with the Trump phenomenon, and nothing happens. But this morning I wake up in the hotel and I saw CNN making the, the story where, where Trump is basically admitting, or I don't know, not correct, uh, uh, I don't know what the word is, but not correct uh, wordings used and uh, say then he's really playing that, was in that, but believe me, I will tell you the truth in the future. What, how do you see this one in the campaign red? Is the fact checking kind of starting to work or, uh, or does he have to protect himself from that one or how do you interpret it in, the, in, the, in, the, in view of the elections? From the clip that I saw, he, he expressed regret in causing personal pain, but he didn't specify what that meant. Um, so I leave that uh, for a follow-up question. Hopefully next time someone interviews him, they will ask him, what, what were you expressing regret about? I'm not sure if it was for 
getting false ratings and fact checks. I, I'm guessing it, it wasn't. It sounded to me like that was a speech uh, for the latest iteration of his campaign. He's got a new campaign manager, uh, new writing new speeches, a new message. Um, so that sounded like someone saying, okay, I've learned some lessons. We're, I'm not gonna specify what they were. Um, I'm going to try to sound different. And because this is not the first time his campaign has had this sort of reboot, I guess we have to wait and see if it really is a new, a new message and a new consistent uh, version of the candidate or not. It didn't look like he's regretting really about playing with the words. I mean, interpretation, but I just saw the same. Probably can't fact check that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think I will have to see uh, what what that turns into. Um, but but it, I mean, he he has been interesting in the sense that, um, like like the Obama uh, ISIS example, he's stuck. He will he will stick to statements for much longer than um, other politicians will after being uh, called out by. By uh, truth squatting or fact checking, but but he will he will budge. I mean, it's uh, with that one. I think the initial the the final budge was I was being sarcastic, right? After days of saying no, I'm being literal. I'm being literal. Then he said I was being sarcastic. So he he does with the fact checking. And, and again, I think for 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 us at CNN, I can speak for it. Our goal with the fact check is to present. Uh, information to our audience. Not to change what the candidate says. Not to not. change right. what the candidate says. That's not, we put the information out there and then people do different things with it. But our goal is just, we, we know this thing to be true or false um, and we present that information. Well, what's interesting from actually going to the events is a lot of Trump supporters don't really uh, care. Not that he was right or he was wrong, but they will say, well, he doesn't really mean it, or um, he's, just, he's just saying that, but I think he's gonna do that. And that's really interesting to cover as a reporter because uh, we only have people's words and actions to, to write about and judge them by, but there's, a, I think, a significant segment of his supporters, just anecdotally, I don't have numbers, that uh, excuse what he says or take it as they think he means it. And in some cases, he has kind of uh, justified that by saying it was a joke. People can't take a joke. Or I was sarcastic. Or, and so I think a lot of the people who, who like him understand that about him. Or we can't, we can't assume that. We are reporters. We have to say, well, he said it. He said he meant it. He said it seriously. He repeated it several times. We are going to treat it seriously. But a lot of his supporters will say, he doesn't, he's not actually going to do that. Um, they just take it as a broader sign of his character. He won't back down. So yeah, like and, that. and I don't know if you heard um, uh, in that tape what was sort of interesting, and I haven't seen the crowd reaction, but the crowd really reacted when he said that. There was a big buildup um, where he was saying, uh, in these situations, you do this, and you know, and then he he said, okay, so I regret this, thing. and it was it was interesting hearing to me. It was interesting hearing the crowd really react to that, um, because as as Pat says, much of his image has been, and with his supporters, this sort of embrace of um, you know not backing down to the to media fact checkers and um, and sort of this anti political correctness. So. It'll be interesting to see what his supporters take from that, too. Uh, hi, uh, Franek Vichorka, Belarus, Radio for Europe. Um, I'm very concerned with uh, everything you're saying here. Uh, we have a deal with uh, typical propaganda. You know, Trump is very often compared to Lukashenko in 1994, when he came to power. He was lying many, many, many times, and uh, independent media were struggling with his lies. But finally, uh, we understood that people, uh, people are not care, you know, with facts. People uh, take politics and uh, politician, and Lukashenko specifically, as an entertainer, as a guy who often says great interesting things. 
And the problem is that a um, uh, similar situation is happening, as I see, in America. People are not worried about truths, about facts. They uh, want to, to be uh, shocked every day, to be entertained, you know, they want to share these stories. These stories are getting viral on Facebook and, uh, and finally Trump is uh, getting leader in the race. But my question is about the um, conclusion from the previous presentation of our today, um, uh, today's forum, that uh, the only way is to find new uh, ways, new means, you know, to present facts. Uh, because as you can see, all, all this stuff that CNN, PolitiFact is doing, it's not working with the people who do not want to see facts. Uh, so what ways could be used to, uh, to make people understand they are, uh, yeah, they are just like uh, f faked, they are just like uh, uh, getting untruths? Well, I, I think, uh, so like the issue of crime, I think, is, and the perception of crime in the United States, I think, is an interesting example to think about. So. Like, like Trump has brought up crime in the United States and said that it's, you know, it's, I think he said it was rising under Obama. Um, so what's interesting is we, d we can do a fact check on that, but if you take what stories get covered, both in national media and, and local media, a lot of them are crime stories. So from the perspective of what media can think about, and you know, the US, our model, is primarily a market-based model, right? So, you know, it's 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 been interesting because the the internet tells us more so than anything else what people click on. You know, so we know what stories are attracting people, and it's you know, I mean, it's it's a bit of a pickle in that sense because <laughs> these are the stories that people are clicking on. People are clicking on these different stories and our business model is one where we, to a certain extent, need to cover stories that people are interested in. Um, I think there are, are opportunities, um, and this, I, I, I sound sort of like an optimist with this, but I think there are really important opportunities as it relates to storytelling. And that's a word that's become sort of like a gimmick in the United States. But what I mean is, um, we know, for example, at CNN, that when we have stories that we've really spent time crafting and have, you know, really beautiful scenes, like the scene that Pat had at the beginning, you know, this sort of like putting people in these places, we know that people will click on those stories and stay on those stories for long periods of time. So I think one of the things that journalists really need to do is, is, is take story really seriously. You know, facts matter. Facts will always matter for journalists, but stories really matter. And finding those stories that people are going to get sucked into really, really matter. And so finding the sweet spot where those stories are also very important for the democracy, I think, is, is really where we need to be looking. Well, and I wouldn't generalize either that nobody cares about facts. I mean, I, I don't think that's true. Um, and Maybe it is because we come from the U.S. model, but we are not in the business of telling people what to think or how to think, um, and whether they are right or wrong in feeling or liking or what they like or don't like, right? We have to kind of do our job and let the chips fall where they may. Um, and I would say there is also some burden on the party and elected officials themselves to to figure out what they want for their own future leaders. Um, if, if we've seen anything with Trump is that sometimes when he gets called out by his own party, uh, that will force him to recalibrate a little bit uh, because he needs the support of certain key people in the party. Uh, but that that's not a burden, I think, that we're, you know, we have to carry like, well, people don't care about the truth, what are we gonna do? Well, we're still gonna report it. And hopefully people will still read it. And like Emma said, and, and hopefully with Brian's workshops later too, with storytelling, we'll see different ways of telling the stories, maybe more graphic ways, um, better charts, better videos, uh, doing what I do, which is tell stories of day-to-day -day campaign and not just facts you know, thrown out there. Uh, that will resonate with people. But there is this, 
big ideal of what we would like people to read and what they really read. And, and you know, everyone always complains that we write about polls, right? We write so much about polls. It's the horse race. Why are you writing about the horse race every day? Write about polls. Why don't you write about policy issues? I'll tell you why, because people read poll stories. They like to read them. We can see from the numbers, they read them. And if you write a briefing paper on somebody's policies, they don't read it. So we have to cover their policies and their positions, but I'm not gonna stop writing the poll story because obviously there's a dichotomy of what people say they want and what they really want. And we are still in the business of trying to find a balance between those, what people want and, and what we think we have to cover. And, and I'm not sure there will ever be a perfect place um, for us to be with that. Okay, we have time for more questions. Gentlemen here. My name is Karen, I'm from Armenia. Uh, so, as I see from the American media, most of the reports, fact-checking reports, are about uh, Trump's unhonest statements. But in reality, Clinton is also making some statements which are not true, but media is not concentrating the attention on the uh, statements of Clinton and writing only about uh, Trump. And so, some of the voters may think that the Fact-checking reports on Trump are a kind of bias, and this job will like lost the credibility for ordinary voters. Do you think that an unbalanced fact-checking reports on Trump and Clinton will somehow make your um, objectivity under the question? Well, I think there cannot be a false equivalency of candidates, not just in this election, but in any election. I'm not going to count the number of fact checks on one and the number of fact checks on the other and have them be the same because no two candidates are the same and there might not be the same number of statements. Some people, right? I, I, I know what you mean because there has been criticism that, that there hasn't been as much coverage of some of the Clinton um, stories. Now, for our, my newspaper, I can say we've covered them and Maybe they're not as well read, but I can't do anything about them not being read by more people. You know, if we're covering them, people can choose whether to read or not to read them. And some of that is also on Trump, because uh, times where Clinton has a really bad story out, he has created his own news and stepped on the story, right? Um, so I, I think you'll see from Aaron that they have checked they, all the candidates, and Trump has many more false statements, and that's just how it is, and they're not gonna stop fact-checking him just because he has more false statements. Um, I think with the voters, the, some of the Clinton issues you would think are more concrete to stick in their head, like email, everybody knows email. Everybody knows that if you... But the media broke that story. The, Clinton said not true that she acknowledged about the email like process. No, but that's the thing, we did we all only covered that reports, story. Only few reports were reported about it. I don't think that's true. I think we did cover it. I just think uh, Trump drowned it out with his own bad week of news. But we all covered that. So that's what I'm saying. Like you, maybe a lot of people missed it. Uh, I'm not sure, like I said, we have no control over whether something gets a lot of clicks or doesn't or goes viral or becomes part of the conversation. They were all covered. Um, it, they just, we put them out there and then people decide what they want to do with it. I'm not sure if you guys have the same frustration, but we do because it's like, well, first of all, the media broke the email story. Um, you know, it's the New York Times. It doesn't get more like mainstream media than that. Um, they've broken a lot of different bits of the email story. When, when Clinton said that the FBI, that she hadn't lied to the FBI, everyone jumped in like and said, wait, well, you might have not lied to the FBI, but then you said something different to the American public. It's just that Trump was having a really bad week that week too, and so he got a lot of coverage. And you would have thought she would have had more coverage that week because it was a really bad story, but then he kept making news, and so it's hard to, what are you supposed to do, like stop covering Trump because Clinton, I just, it's, it's really, it's, it's a challenge, and I think it's a fair 
point, but I don't think you can ignore that we've all covered it. It's just maybe hasn't gotten as much resonance, and I, I can't explain that, um, but I'm at a loss for that. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sophie Detishvili from Republic of Georgia, broadcasting company, Rustavi 2. So my question is like this. Uh, you both, like CNN and your media outlet, has some kind of analytics, how many people read the stories and what are their feedbacks on it. What do you think, which uh, topic is more popular when Trump says that Obama is financing ISIS or when you say that it's false? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I haven't seen the analytics for that particular one. Me neither. Um, My guess is usually when it's said. It's just a guess. But I, usually the initial headline will probably make the bigger traction. And, and I think going back to the previous question, it's still when you're a media phenomenon of a candidate like Trump, he has benefited from that. He hasn't had to pay for advertising, right, like Clinton has. But the downside of that is what we were talking about before. When, we has a, when he has a bad week, it is magnified because he is a media phenomenon. So that might step on Clinton news. But my, my guess is it's more when he says it than the false check, um, especially for something like that. Because like I said, a lot of the people at these rallies do, already don't believe that that's true. They're just, they're taking it, interpreting it and being like, well, he doesn't actually mean that. He's just criticizing Obama in general and his Middle East policy. I know, I know, but people don't always take it that way. Uh, hello again. Uh, thank you for interesting presentations. I wanted to ask actually two questions. First of all, there are quite a lot of stages during the election campaign with Trump when people thought, okay, he cannot continue with this kind of rhetoric, he cannot continue with this kind of scandals, for example, when he blamed women for everything, when he had Trump University, and et cetera, and et cetera. But in the end, it came out that he was even more successful after these scandals, which supposed to have ended his political campaign. So what do you think was the most damaging for him during his whole campaign, both in primaries and now in national elections, to his campaign? What was the most damaging story? Because from, from our point of view, from my point of view, from far away, it seems to be the can story with the family, with a very concrete family, an emotional story of people who lost their son in the battles in Iraq and he was you know, laughing at them and etc. So this seemed to be the most important and most resonating factor in his campaign, negative factor. Uh, and another question, here in Lithuania I focus only on practical, practically only, only one matter, that is foreign policy. And he talks about NATO, Putin and etc. How important, in your opinion, is this kind of rhetoric to his uh, electorate? in terms of mobilizing his electorate, not gaining criticism from everyone else, including Republicans, but in mobilizing his own electorate. Is it important? Because it doesn't seem to be the most uh, crucial factor uh, which gets him be, be more popular. So thank you. Well, I've never heard any, I've never interviewed anyone at a Trump rally say, I'm going to vote for Trump because of his position on NATO. Um, you know, I have not. But you do interview people who say, I'm going, to inter I'm going to vote for him because he is going to be strong on foreign policy. And so whether his statement on NATO made them think that or not, I think it's a general kind of broader impression. He's going to be strong. We're going to win again. We're going to make America great again. Those are not specifics, but people like how it feels. They want to feel, um, they want to feel safe, and they want to feel like the country is, is winning in whatever that word may mean. So I think you're right. It's not the specifics of foreign policy that attract uh, supporters to his candidacy, I don't think. Um, as to your other question about the cons, uh, you know, I, I don't know that you can say that anything has been negative still. You know, he, he won the nomination, so presumably, um, the stuff that, that happened during the primary wasn't really negative because he won anyway. Um, and I know that it seems like the polls show Clinton ahead and, and there's no way that that's going to change, but a lot of people, even if it's hard to believe in this room, are not 
tuned into the election on a daily basis in the United States. In the United States, a lot of people don't follow politics at all. And they start paying attention after the beginning of September, maybe. So a lot could still change. Um, and the cons, you know, were, uh, what was bad for Trump during that week was that it kept going. It wasn't just one night at the Democratic National Convention. It was that Mr. Khan kept going on television and taking interview after interview, rebutting Trump and the campaign, and the campaign didn't put an end to it. They kept fighting back and bringing it up on their own, which is what I was saying, like he generates his own bad news that gets magnified because he's a media phenomenon candidate. Um, so I think it was a bad week for him. I don't think we can assume that most Americans know that or care about that or followed that because it is still August, it's the summer, um, people are on vacation, and they are not going to necessarily remember that in October or November. I think we have a few minutes for one more question. Okay. Hi, I'm Hanna from Ukraine. Thank you for a very interesting discussion. Uh, when I talk to my uh, friends from America, they all are shocked that Trump is really have chances to win these elections. But for me, it seems very like obvious that he has the chances because um, Trump was on television for many, many years and um, if we look like 20 years ago, he was commenting all the, uh, all the news. He was in uh, all the main uh, programs. He was even in Sex and the City TV series. Uh, so he, he was very popular and media made him very popular. And now we are kind of shocked that uh, now he's uh, main candidate for president. Uh, what do you think? Because for me, it's, uh, uh, Trump is a product of, uh, of media, of news, of journalists. <laughs> I, I think he has definitely shown a mastery of the media environment that, that we have not seen in presidential elections before. He was a celebrity before he was a candidate. We really haven't seen that. I mean, people already knew who he was. Um, but they didn't know who he was as a politician, which is what has been interesting uh, for us. Um, you may have been a better predictor uh, than everybody else in the U.S. who thought that he wasn't even going to win the nomination. And I would start by saying his Republican opponents didn't think that. And as a result, uh, they probably didn't take him on uh, as early as, as they should have. In a regular election, they would have, we were talking about this last night, they would have had a strategy to go against him like they did for every other opponent from the second he launched his campaign. And instead they ignored him for weeks, for months, thinking he was going to go away by himself. He was going to implode in some way. And uh, I'd say a lot of the media, you might say he was a candidate of the media, but I think a lot of the media also didn't take him seriously as a candidate at first. And so um, by the time everybody did, it was already locked in with with his supporters, and uh, here we are. So I don't know what the genesis of his campaign was. I think uh, the earlier presentation was right that we're going to be studying this, and by we I mean political scientists. They're gonna be studying this for years because it is kind of a confluence of a lot of things happening at the same time. I wanted to go back to the con question just one second because what I didn't mention there was there are a lot of people who will mention that as a reason for Trump supporters who will say he needs to focus on something other than that. So for what it's worth, it resonated enough to trickle to some people, but not to everybody. Did you want to talk about the media phenomenon? <laughs> well, CNN! I, <laughs> I think there's, there's, there's two different things there, right? Because, um, you know, The Apprentice, obviously, or The Appren Apprentice, right. Mm -hmm. I never watched it, so. Um, but, I mean, obviously that's straight up entertainment, right? So like that's a different, Thing. And as Pat was saying, like people knew who he was, but didn't know who he was as a politician. And I think in some ways he's figuring out himself, right? right. Who he is as a politician. Right. Um, so, I mean, there's certainly, what I'll say is this, and, and I think we have sort of an indication of just 
how interesting his candidacy is because every question, apart from one, ha has been about Trump, right? Um, so people want an explanation for how he got to where he is, and I think, I think it may be over overstating the power of, of media to, to a degree, um, perhaps, because name ID really matters in politics and that just means like, do people know who that person is? Because sometimes what happens when people go to the polls is that they say, I know that person, I have thoughts and feelings about who that person is. Um, and his was virtually at 100% right. when he launched, right. which is unheard of in, in presidential politics. Clinton's was, apart, from, Clinton, right. apart from Hillary Clinton. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I don't mean this in any way as a cop-out, but I think, I think it will be something that is, that is studied by political scientists, and I don't, I don't want to step on their toes by uh, presuming to... But yeah, we're not almighty, all-powerful. Um, we're neither as powerful as people think, or as ignored as people think. I yeah, think. I think yeah. that's right. Okay, we have like three minutes. Probably ten minutes left. So uh, I reserve last question for you, Gintras, because you know that you prepared many of those questions. But it's so great that you are asking <laughs> actively. It's amazing. So last question is for, for from you, and then we will change topic and after that it's lunch so just hang on you think we're going to change topic <laughs> <laughs> thank you skirman this uh it's actually very simple uh we're talking about trump uh, always about trump one question about clinton but back to fact checking uh, uh, uh am you working tv and uh fact checking is probably a lot more different than in digital digital or press uh is it possible to effectively, basically you have to fact check live what the candidate or you know, a politician is saying during a press conference or a statement or how, how is, it, uh, is it, is it effective, is it working do you think? Uh, to, to fact check live on TV? Uh, I mean, <laughs> it's hard uh, because you know, sometimes there may be a, a clear one that you know yes or no it's true, but for a lot of them what we're doing is the really boring work of slogging through government data on unemployment figures or um, housing data. And that is neither sexy nor fast. <laughs> so we try to turn things around quickly, um, but doing it in real time is, is very challenging. Unless it's something that's been said a bunch of times and we know definitive. That's, that's why I wanted to use the example of the, the Japan nuclear, because that was that was new for us, um, and um, we'll see if that continues. I mean, there's not going to be, everything is not going to be as straightforward as that. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, I would like the audience uh, to thank our uh, guests. I think it was, very, it was a you. very interesting discussion, <laughs> and uh, we'll see you soon. Fact-checking plays an important role to kind of help uh, stop the spread of misinformation. This is a really interesting story, and I, I'm going to take us away from politics ever so slightly, because I think th there's no better story that encapsulates what fact-checking can do than this one. Um, this is a story I first heard from a colleague uh, who uh, is from London uh, and helped found a fact-checking organization in South Africa called Africa Check. And he was telling me the story, uh, and it just, it's amazing. Um, so in, in the early 2000s, uh, Africa was close to being uh, polio free. We, we were, and it was because of a huge investment by the United States and other countries to try to uh, increase the use of the polio vaccine, get people vaccinated for polio, um, and really eradicate uh, potentially a debil debilitating disease on a continent, just a major achievement. So what happened? Uh, something went wrong. And what went wrong is that in three Nigerian states, religious leaders and political leaders believed that the polio vaccine was actually not intended for good, but it was being used to sterilize young Muslim girls. And so there was, there was a huge um, kind of populist uprising against the polio vaccine. 
Uh, and so it started with religious leaders and doctors and, and this kind of spread through the masses and no one really corrected the information. No one that people trusted corrected the information. And so eventually the political leaders in Nigeria, they bowed to this political pressure and they stopped the vaccination uh, program. And so what happened? Well, it, exactly what you think would happen. Uh, we, we saw an outbreak of polio in Nigeria um, that it took years to uh, get under control, cost $500 million to get under control, and eliminated the ability to say we can eradicate uh, polio in Africa by the end of that decade. And so just imagine if there were people that uh, folks in Nigeria could trust who were able to kind of present truthful, accurate, honest information what we could have done, you know? Fact checking unfortunately did not exist in this case. Journalists weren't there to tell the story, um, to, to help, uh, uh, in this case, uh, citizens and voters and, and viewers and readers understand the truth. And so we were left with this. This to me, it's just an amazing story of what the power of fact checking can be. Um, here's, another, here's another story that I, I, I think is a good one for us to talk about. Uh, fact checking, can be an antidote uh, to the spread of misinformation. There's some research, this is from 2012, the 2012 election. Um, uh, uh, some researchers, what they did is they sent uh, letters to politicians in, across the United States. And they sent, uh, there were three groups, uh, so some legislators or lawmakers were given a letter saying PolitiFact is uh, coming to your state or your area and they're gonna be fact checking the claims that you make. Essentially like a warning letter, like, be careful, fact checkers are here. Um, a second group of lawmakers got a letter that said, uh, fact checking is important and being honest about uh, what you say in politics is important. It was more of a neutral letter. It, it tried to reinforce the idea, be, be honest what you're saying, but do not give them the threat that fact checkers would be there. The third group obviously got no letter, so they were kind of the standard uh, kind of uh, control group. Well, what did the research find? Amazingly, lawmakers who were threatened that fact-checking was coming were less likely to tell a falsehood than the other groups. And so that alone, I guess, is a victory, right? Uh, I don't consider myself as, as a fact-checker of giving people threats, but the idea that we're there, that people know that we are there, influences their behavior in a good way. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting is that uh, we, do have a, we, we do have an issue, and we've talked about it several days, several times here today, of how um, do we reach a wider audience? How do we connect with uh, the average or typical voter or reader or viewer? But the people, and, and we can talk about that, but the people that we do connect with are more informed and better informed, and research suggests that. So it's another huge victory for the fact-checking movement. This is another study, this is more recent, from 2015, and found basically that respondents to a survey who were presented with fact-checks, so presented with information in a way that they can, they was transparent and objective, uh, they, were, they were better informed and able to answer questions at a more, in a better rate than kind of maybe the person Patty was talking to at her Trump rally. Uh, so you see uh, a good sign for that. Uh, I think more than ever, with all the spread of this misinformation and the concept that so many people are now publishers of information, they need uh, a fact-checking as a tool to help them uh, go out in the world and understand uh, what is going on in a better way. Um, for PolitiFact, and we're going to talk more about this in our smaller groups, uh, we started uh, uh, in 2007, really, for the 2008 election with these kind of really fundamental basic values, and I think they're all very important because when we're talking about trust and how we get people to trust us, we have to be very clear about what our mission statement is and what we are and are not. So to me, the mo one of the most important things is that no one is off limits. Uh, the moment that you say, we won't fact check that person, I think you fail the readers and you become far less credible. So I think you have to be clear from the beginning, we will fact check Hillary Clinton, we will fact check Donald Trump, uh, we will fact check anyone anywhere at any time. Uh, to me, another real uh, simple core value is that all of our work must be on the record and that we must present all of the information that we use to form our ratings 
to our readers so they can see exactly how we calculated our verdict, essentially. So everything that we do, I think, should be backed up by source material. Uh, we actually, at PolitiFact, we, we have, we almost call it a bibliography in that you can, you can uh, see not only our story, but every source we talk to. Uh, consult a wide array of experts. Uh, one of the things that I think is typical of a, uh, maybe of a news story is uh, you're writing a political story, uh, say, about um, unemployment. Uh, and you might contact one economist, and an economist will give you one opinion, and you'll include their quote in the news story. Uh, I think for, for fact-checking, that is not enough. Um, you know, uh, I think there's no reason we can't talk to seven or eight or nine or ten or four uh, independent economists in that, in that scenario to show the readers just how much we've done to try to get to the bottom of what this person said and whether or not it's true. Avoid gotchas. I think this is also really an important one. I think, you know, uh, when we talk about the questions of bias and uh, whether people uh, perceive bias, avoiding what you might call a gotcha is, I think, a very important uh, uh, kind of uh, topic. Um, what's, what's a gotcha? Um, you know, it, it'll be something that, you, you know, in, tr in the Trump phenomenon, this is actually very difficult to, because you don't know where a joke is and where truthfulness is. But there are cases when you can clearly say, oh, that's, you can see that was processed as a joke, that was said to be a joke. Avoid fact-checking something like that. Um, for us, uh, the one thing I, here is I, I think a, a metho metho methodology that is uh, universal and, and consistent. And so for us, uh, we have three editors ultimately decide every verdict. So it's not just the reporter who's saying that's false or half true or whatever, that three editors uh, are, are sitting in on that process. We've done that every time for every of the 14,000 fact checks that we now have published on our website. So we've been talking a lot about this guy, um, and it's certainly, uh, it is a lot about him, uh, but it, it's more than him. Uh, but I, I do want to, we have, uh, if the sound is going to work, we have a couple, I have a video I want to play you of some of the things Trump has said. This is in the first year of his campaign, so from June 2015 through June 2016, so it's already a month and a half out of date, but I think it'll give you a sense of what we're dealing with in the United States. talking about the Mexican government forces many bad people into our country because they're smart. I don't think the 11 million, which is a number you've been hearing for many, many years, I've been hearing that number for five years, I don't think that's an accurate number anymore because I'm now hearing it's 30 million, it could even be 34 million. Mexico can't pay for the loss, of course they can. We have a trade deficit with Mexico that's unbelievably big humongous it's a humongous number it's billions and billions of dollars you know his father was with lee harvey oswald prior to oswald's being uh you know shot i mean the whole thing is ridiculous what 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 is this right prior to his being shot and nobody even brings it up i mean they don't even talk about that that was reported uh and nobody talks about it but i think it's horrible i think it's absolutely horrible our schools are failing. Crime is rising. People are scared. They, they might have to pay a little bit more than my proposal, Chuck. Oh, your proposal. I said, okay. I just wanted might to have, get that yeah, clear. Than my proposal. Fair enough. I'm not talking about more than they're paying now. Gotcha. We're the highest tax nation in the world. Our businesses pay more taxes gotcha. than any businesses in the world. I watched when the World Trade Center came tumbling down. And I watched in Jersey City, New Jersey, where thousands and thousands of people were cheering as that building was coming down. Thousands of people were cheering. I was totally against the war in Iraq, very proudly, saying for many years that it would destabilize the Middle East. Sadly, I was correct. Altogether, under the Clinton plan, you'd be admitting hundreds of thousands of refugees from the Middle East with no system to vet them or to, or to prevent the radicalization of the children and their children. 
So the number isn't reflective. I've seen numbers of 24%. I actually saw a number of 42% unemployment. 42%. just some. Uh, let me give you, let me take you a look, and I, I hope you can see this, but I can talk you through it. Um, we recently uh, went back and looked, uh, since we've been fact-checking, this is now our third presidential election, so we now have uh, a, a library of 950 claims or statements that we fact-checked by the major nominees for each uh, party from 2008 2012 and now 2016. And we've talked about this era of post politics in the United States, sorry. Um, and what we've seen is that truth is indeed on the decline. Uh, if you look there, uh, in 2008, in 2008 uh, 30% of the claims that Barack Obama made were rated true. Uh, four years later, uh, that number for him had almost cut in half to 16.67% of the claims that he made were rated true. Uh, in fact, if you look, what I think is really interesting from this, this uh, uh, kind of analysis, 2008 was by far the most truthful election of the three we've covered. Uh, and if you go down and you see at the very bottom, uh, Donald Trump's numbers for 2016 are, are radically different. Um, you can't even, uh, the chart didn't include the number, but I think it's the, he's at 4% of the claims that he's made have been rated true compared with, uh, oh, I think it's over 50% are false or pants on fire. Compare that again uh, with uh, Barack Obama, that number is about 16% from 2008. This is, another, this is another thing that kind of gets at the same point. Uh, through July 2016, Donald Trump has more pants on fire ratings, uh, or has as many, excuse me, uh, 32, uh, as all of the other candidates that we've covered in the, in the three election cycles. So if you added up the pants on fire ratings from Hillary Clinton in 2016, uh, John McCain, Barack Obama in 2008, John McC excuse me, Barack Obama and Mitt Romney in 2012, you get to 32, and that's the same number as uh, Donald Trump this year. So we, we're talking about this. Is this a lost cause? I don't think so. I really don't. Um, first of all, I would say anecdotally is that more people have come and visited PolitiFact, uh, our website, this year than ever before. In fact, uh, through, I think it was in June, um, we passed, and so in less than six months, we had uh, more website to our, more traffic to our website than we did in all of 2015. Uh, so you see how people are craving this information and, and we are able to provide it for them. Um, so a couple of statistics that I think are really interesting. We've done some surveys of our readers uh, to kind of uh, figure out a little bit about what they think of us. Um, the first is a survey we did of journalists around the United States to see, do you think fact-checking is important and credible? And 94% and found our work reliable, which I thought was really interesting. Um, readers, actually, it's even higher. 97% of readers to PolitiFact said they agreed with our decision most or all of the time. And so I think um, what I would say is, is that if you think in the kind of in the broad stroke, um, people are trying to very quickly understand whether something is true or not. Uh, and I think a lot of times uh, a traditional media fails in providing that information. Um, uh, Patty showed you the great work that she's doing at the Herald, but the problem is not enough members of the media do that. Uh, and so you see a lot of examples of people covering quotes and, and putting quotes in, but not telling you whether something and so I think it presents fact checkers a great opportunity to come and be a part of that conversation and help voters and viewers and readers understand very complex problems. Um, and so I think, uh, I think there's uh, a great use 
uh, for our work. And I think I, I have another video clip I want to show you that kind of explains in, in, our, in the PolitiFact world kind of how people have ki come to use our work. PolitiFact, the nonpartisan fact-checking guy or guys or girl. Uh, PolitiFact, which uh, keeps track of whether politicians keep their promises, did they promise kept by me? And by the way, uh, I have mentioned these facts in the past. PolitiFact, who seems to check every statement that I make, checked it out, and what they said is, these facts are basically accurate. Please don't politifact me, whoever is following this. <laughs> so I think when they say things that are inaccurate, they're getting called on it more often. But at PolitiFact, we always say words matter. So Give me the truth. Give me the truth. A nonpartisan fact-checking service called PolitiFact, and PolitiFact rated Fiorina's statement as mostly false. So he's ticked off about this ad, which PolitiFact has already rated mostly false. PolitiFact is out with its lie of the year, and the award goes to hyped up claims about Ebola. PolitiFact took Nancy Pelosi's lines of what she said. They just said true. It was just out and out false. PolitiFact says that's not true, but the ad's resonating. What's your reaction? 40% at best, and that's, that's, uh, that's only because I'm going to be PolitiFacted. So. <laughs> The ad was an outrage, so outrageous that PolitiFact, I know they don't think fact checkers matter, but PolitiFact called it wholly inaccurate. The statements aren't always, you know, rated true by PolitiFact. PolitiFact. Do you not know what PolitiFact is? The, uh, the, the last I image uh, video is from a State Department briefing. That's uh, Marie Harf, who used to be a State Department spokes spokeswoman. Um, certainly, uh, her and Jen Psaki were certainly exposed to a lot of the Russian propaganda. Um, I went to college with Marie, so I think that's always interesting. Um, so this is my last slide, and then we have some time for questions. Uh, this is verbatim from the founder of PolitiFact, Bill Adair, and he wrote an article recently uh, that I think is just really apt uh, for what we're talking about. So rather than try to uh, better his words, I will just simply read them. Um, All news organizations should call out falsehoods in everyday coverage of speeches, campaign commercials, and political debates. Noting the accuracy of a political claim should be as standard as including someone's hometown or party affiliation. What, what an amazing, a simple, uh, simple statement of fact, but I think something that would be very important. What if it was, what if your editors back home said, as, it, it's as important to get the person's name spelled right as it is to say what, what they're saying, if it's true or not. And if we all held ourselves to those standards, I think we would separate ourselves as journalists among that group of, of publishers where anyone can publish information. That's how we make the difference. Editors and news directors have traditionally taken a cautious approach when covering political news and left the verification to the fact checkers. They've been okay with instant punditry, but left, have, left the harder work of verifying claims for later if they have done it at all. To me, this is another really important uh, kind of statement. Um, before, uh, in 2013, uh, we launched uh, at PolitiFact a kind of a site called Pundit Fact. And what we did is we checked the accuracy of claims made on television. So in CNN world, it's, you know, they have the four, six boxes of people all shouting at each other. Um, I've seen boxes or images in like Pakistan where it's like 17, imagine that, like 17 people all in their little box yelling at each other. It's quite amazing. One of the problems, and CNN is tackling this head on, which I think is really important, but one of the problems in television news is that often people are not challenged on the assertions they make on television. And so we launched this project to fact check uh, what people say on TV. 
In the first year, uh, we fact-checked 300 claims. And of the 300, basically half, 150, were f false in some, in some variety, some variety of false. Um, what we went back and we saw of the 150 claims that were false, only seven were actually corrected. So more than 90% of the time, no one corrected the misstatements they made on television. And we actually talked to people about this and tried to figure out why. And what we came to the conclusion is, is because the people who are paid to talk on television are paid to give loud, obnoxious opinions. They're the people who are invited back. We're not on TV all that much because, quite frankly, we're very boring because most of our answers are like, that's, that's slightly true but partially misleading or, you know, here's this, this statistic says this but you shouldn't blame the president because of X. Um, so the people who win in, in, these, in, in, in media are often the loudest, who, get, who have the most kind of um, far left or far right opinions. And so I think that's something we all need to think about is that how can we, to have a better, more informed electorate, does not it take more rational, reasoned debates and maybe not 17 boxes of people yelling at each other. It's easier today for reporters to fact check. Many claims can be confirmed or debunked with some brief research. If journalists don't have enough time, they can cite the work of nonpartisan fact checkers such as factcheck.org or PolitiFact. This is, this is exactly the paragraph that uh, you saw folks like uh, Patty at the Miami Herald seizing on and saying like, I can, we can all do our little part. We don't have to have a fact checking apparatus like PolitiFact to be a fact checker. Um, and so I'll leave you with this for now. We can take some questions. Is that I, I, I truly believe uh, that every day as journalists, when we sit down and we decide to tell a story, uh, uh, we're, we fall too often in a rut where we make a decision to, um, we're covering the speech by the president. And, and so if you're on TV, the, that story takes the form of uh, the president speak, speaking, you cut away to me doing my stand-up, then I maybe get a crowd reaction, and then that's my story. If you're in print, it's the same kind of, uh, kind of version. You talk to, you, you quote from the speech, maybe you call the opposing campaign or get their comment, maybe you talk to a couple of people at the rally, and that's your story. What I want everyone to do is have a conversation at the start of every story they tell uh, and say, how is the best way to present this information? And so Brian later will be saying, maybe the answer is in a chart or a graphic, great. Uh, maybe the answer is in a, uh, in a series of photos. Maybe it's an audio recording. Maybe it's just the speech text itself. I think we need to get to a place where we need to have the conversation where one of the ways to tell those stories is through a fact check. So imagine any story you've written uh, and say, if I were going to write this as a fact check, what would be different about it? I think often what you'd find is there are small differences, um, but they're not huge ones. So if you're covering the city council or the city government, they're talking about their budget, a story you might write every year, why not tell that story as a fact check? Is there something that you can tell that helps people better understand a situation in a more concrete, specific way, but also gives them all the information they're looking for? And so I really think political fact checking can be a movement in a form of journalism that separates us from all ways that is out there. So I'm a big believer in it. I know we're gonna keep talking about it, but thank you very much. And I, I think I have a couple of minutes for questions, right? Uh, thank you for your presentation. I am Viktor Denisenko, geopolitica.lt, Vilnius, Lithuania. I want to ask um, how you think um, does fact checking, uh, um, could it uh, vanish some myths from internet, for example? Because uh, it's funny, but uh, here in Lithuania, uh, we also have a group of people who believe that vaccination is a uh, bad thing for example. Thank you. So, I think there are, I have a couple answers on uh, top, top of my head. The first is that we have not tried this at PolitiFact, but I think this would be a very interesting experiment if someone, some media organization had the resources to do it. 
And so what I would do is take vaccinations. So um, maybe your friend is on Facebook or something and posts something that's against vaccination. What if a professional organization fact checked a claim about that and said, no, that's not true. And then uh, uh, someone from that organization went to people's Facebook fa feeds and said, hey, I saw that you posted this. Here's the correct information. You know, I think that's the one interesting possibility is to present information directly to, uh, to the, the people who have it wrong and see if we can change their mind. Uh, another thing that I think is interesting that we are starting to do at PolitiFact, um, you know, those viral images, we call them memes. So it's, uh, there's a lot of them in the, in the US presidential race that are being shared. Uh, there was one recently talking about how there was a lot of uh, uh, election fraud. And so Donald Trump has been talking about the election potentially being rigged. And so people are, were using some statistics from 20, 2012, 2012, to say, uh, yes, the system is rigged. Uh, and so we saw this image, and it was being shared thousands of times on Facebook, and we fact-checked it, and we found all of the claims were wrong uh, for a number of reasons. And so what we did is we actually went and we recreated the image. So we made it right. So the idea was if someone is sharing the wrong, uh, you now have the ability to share the correct information. Uh, those are a couple of techniques. I think, you know, um, I think one of the, it is, it will remain always difficult to convince somebody um, if you believe vaccinations are wrong and, and are damaging for your children, it is difficult for anyone to convince you otherwise. I think what all we can do is make sure that people have the correct factual information, and then, if, then they can make their own value judgment. So I'm not worried if they're changing their mind. I'm worried uh, that they have the access to the best information. You brought some examples but, uh, about what Trump said, but all of them were kind of statistical, uh, statistical falses uh, that you can easily check. But when, a case, when it's a case about something more complicated, mm -hmm. how do you check and how do, how do you get to the point when you are sure that this is final uh, true? Ah, very good. Um, so I think uh, one of the things that we've built at PolitiFact is a, uh, a long library of experts uh, who can help us understand whether something is true or not. So um, we have uh, probably around 50 to 75 uh, immigration experts, so people who study immigration for a living. These are people who you would consider objective or neutral, but there are also people who you would say are anti-immigration, and then there are people who you, who you would consider pro-immigration. And so in, on claims where it's not as simple as 2 plus 2 equals 4 or 2 plus 2 equals 5, we'll often email, and we can do this now uh, everyone at once, we'll email all 75 experts and we'll say, here's what we're fact checking. Um, and we'll get 7, 10, 15 responses back. And um, over time, I think what we've learned is that it, uh, most, in most cases, you could have a difference of opinion on the policy. So uh, you could support or oppose uh, building a wall, or you can support or oppose uh, uh, creating a system where the people who are living in the United States illegally are allowed to gain legal status. Um, but when it comes to factual questions, the experts often line up. They often have similar opinions. And so you'll be able to find, uh, through interviewing a wide array of people, ah, everyone kind of sees this issue as this is, this is a problem with this statement, or this is correct about this statement, and then you can kind of make uh, a decision that way. Um, to me, if you, if, there, it, it, that's, if you don't have the primary information, which means you can't find the statistic in a report or you can't get the answer, that is the best second, second uh, line there, is to interview as many experts as possible and see where they all agree, and then where they don't, then highlight those differences, and that'll help you decide your verdict. The other thing with PolitiFact that is a little bit different, maybe, is uh, we, uh, 
we all always ask the person who is making this claim, you know, where did you get your information from? And so they help when they, when they provide that information, that helps us understand uh, in a better way how to judge what they're saying. If they don't provide that information, obviously we'll still seek it out through any means we can. But when they say, you know, if they if this if the idea is if it's this claim about healthcare and Hillary Clinton made made the claim, we'll ask where did you get your information from, and she'll provide that evidence for us, and that helps us better understand if it's true or not. Yeah, hey. Do you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you for the very interesting presentation. Um, I want to ask more about methodology. Mm -hmm. So how do you choose? Because uh, I understand that uh, you cannot like uh, uh, check everybody and everything that they say. And um, it's um, like linked to the matter of trust because yeah. the last video you showed there were a lot of like uh, trustworthy, independent, uh, yes. and so on and so on. So, what is your methodology, and did you have the issues of trust when you started, and how do you sure. deal with it? Yeah, uh, so on the issue of trust, absolutely. Um, you can imagine when we first started in 2007, people didn't know what PolitiFact was, they didn't know how to say it, they didn't return our phone calls. Um, and so it took a while for people to understand who we are, what we do. Um, and my, my main piece of advice there is to be as open and transparent uh, as, as you can for every fact check you do. So I can remember when we started, I would be on the phone with a political campaign for half hour, 45 minutes, explaining here's exactly what we do, here's ex exactly how we do it, um, do you have any questions? Um, and now over time, we don't have to have those conversations because people do understand us and recognize us, but it definitely took a long time. And so I would, anyone who's trying this, I would not get discouraged by the idea that people don't, don't trust you or how do you build up trust? You build up trust by doing more fact checks and showing exactly the things I talked about, that you will fact check Hillary Clinton and you and Donald Trump, and that, you know, um, yes, every day people say, you only fact check Donald Trump and you only give him false ratings. And then what's always amazing is I just go to our website and I could do it today, and our most recent fact check is a pants on fire claim for Hillary Clinton. And that's so, then you realize that's just people saying what they want to believe. It's not actually true. Um, so. Um, our methodology, we'll talk about that in the smaller groups, so I, but there, there's a lot to go into there, but for this, I'll save that for later. I see there, is, uh, there are many more questions, but like Aaron said, we will have long workshop, some of you today, some of you tomorrow, so you will be able to ask those questions for sure.